many many have lost their lives and uh, even uh, livelihoods, the economic aspects strained our health system. Uh, globally, we have over 200 million uh, people who have been affected or affected with the virus, over 4.5 million deaths. Uh, we'll get more details when the presentation comes on board. Of course, last year, as the Kenya uh, country, we had the first case being reported in early in March. And at uh, that particular time, in relation to the pregnancy, not much was known. So, of course, we have moved from a space of unknown, the fears, anxiety, up to this stage that at least there's some information that uh, we have gathered based on the evidence that's around. And we'll be able to unpack this in the course of time by we, our facilitators we, whom we have here. Of course, pregnancy brings itself with a bundle of joy and uh, everyone expects a positive experience during the pregnancy. The Minister of Health locally had developed the protocols to mitigate against the COVID, uh, the spread of the COVID. And some of these have affected access to the services at that particular time last year and even early this year, or of during these cases, this, uh, the surges that we have had. Uh, some of these measures affect the access to the services. But right now, we are not just dealing with access to the services, but we are also dealing with the observed uh, cases of the virus affecting the pregnancy outcomes. We have had to do it globally, professional associations or bodies, uh, governments making declarations, the statements coming out from the ACOG, the, Africa, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, the RCOG, the International Confederation of Midwives, even locally at the uh, professional body, Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society, amongst many other experts giving statements relating to COVID vaccination, COVID-19 vaccination. Today we have our World Health Organization experts and our uh, local experts going to break this down to us to allay any anxiety on, on this and also give us evidence that is available that will hope will stream, will help us navigate this and therefore the national, at the national level will have guidelines which will help us pursue this to protect our women and our babies. My name is Dr. Dan Okora. I work for the United Nations Population Fund as the Sexual Reproductive Health Advisor. I'll invite my colleague, uh, Dr. Yaron Wolman, who is the Chief of Health at UNICEF, to give remarks on behalf of the UN. Welcome, Dr. Yaron. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan. Uh, good morning, colleagues. It's extremely impressive to see nearly 500 participants on this uh, call. And I think that it really attests to the importance of this uh, subject. So first and foremost, I would really like to welcome uh, all the uh, participants and all the uh, speakers and moderators. Uh, as mentioned by uh, my colleague, Dr. Dan Okoro, my name is Dr. Yaron Wolman. I'm the chief of health with UNICEF Kenya and also currently the deputy chair of the uh, Development Matters for Health in Kenya uh, executive. And on behalf of both, I would really like to welcome everyone to the call, I, uh, to this uh, webinar. I would like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, KNH, uh, UNFPA, and uh, WHO. I think this webinar is of really um, extreme importance and the number of participants attest uh, to that. And the reason is that we really need to demystify the issue of COVID-19 and the vaccinations for COVID-19 and different considerations in pregnancy and breastfeeding. The evidence, I believe at this point in time, after a year and a half since the outbreak has started is non-equivocal. It is very clear, it is clear cut but uh, nevertheless, in our era of social media and uh, rumors and misinformation, there's so much um, to be demystified in order to be very, very clear regarding those life-saving issues for pregnant women and for newborns, uh, which are related to uh, the vaccination. The recommendations are clear cut. The scientific evidence is clear cut. And as our colleagues from KNH and from WHO and from the ministry will be showing us, uh, the 
issue is very, very clear. It's not a matter of how to communicate that with patients, with public health practitioners, with health administrators, and with the public as a whole, in order to make sure that every pregnant woman, every breastfeeding woman, every newborn and every infant are well protected from COVID-19 and from the secondary impacts of COVID-19 through vaccination and also through the other mitigation measures which are uh, available. I really would like to call all participants and I'm sure that <clears throat> all colleagues on the call are uh, clinicians and public health practitioners uh, like myself to really take uh, the important role, not only in terms of our work as um, clinicians and public health practitioners, but as strong advocates in this era of misinformation, strong advocates uh, with our patients, within our communities, within our co-workers, friends, family, uh, professional and personal networks, in order to really ensure that the demystification of COVID-19 and vaccination considerations in pregnancy and uh, breastfeeding related to the women and to the newborns are disseminated and socialized as wide as possible to be able to benefit as many Kenyan women, babies, families, and communities. I would stop here because uh, I really would like the uh, deliberations and the presentations to, uh, to proceed because there's so much to absorb, so much evidence, uh, brilliant presentations uh, to come. So um, I would close here with again, welcoming all participants in this important webinar, thanking the organizers and looking forward to the extremely important and rich deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yaron. And we actually also appreciate and acknowledge the coordination work that you, with UNICEF and yourself are doing, especially working with other partners and other bilaterals to support the Kenya government to make vaccines accessible to the many people in our country. So without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, we expected the Minister of Health, uh, believe we'll be able to get someone in the course of the time to join us and with that particular time make remarks. So uh, I'll re welcome my colleague, Dr. Filomena Owende, Onzai to make a presentation. Dr. Owende is a senior medical specialist at the Department of uh, Obstetric and Gynecology at the Kenyatta National Hospital. And she's going to share with her us experience at Kenyatta and probably also giving a, a bit of a national picture. Karibu, Dr. Terry. Thank you, Dr. Dan Okoro, and good morning to all our colleagues. Uh, I will start uh, this uh, presentation and I'm going to present on experiences and challenges in the management of COVID-19 in pregnancy at Kenyatta National Hospital. And I'd, I'd like to begin with a quote from uh, Michael Levitt, who served as a US Secretary of Health and Human Services in 2007. And uh, he said that everything we do before a pandemic will seem alarmist, and everything we do after will seem inadequate. Just like President Obama said that uh, should an airborne viral pandemic emerge, we should be prepared. And at that time, it seemed alarmist. COVID-19 has not spared pregnant women and has stretched our healthcare system. And we as healthcare workers, we've been trying to adopt to the shifting evidence since COVID-19 is a rapidly evolving situation with rapidly shifting protocols. Now, Tang et al. has summarized this, uh, that there is limited evidence to identify the real impact of COVID-19 on sexual and reproductive health. As at 1st September, 
at the time of uh, preparing these slides, we had over 230,000 reported cases, disproportionately affecting males with close to 5,000 deaths. However, the data that we have doesn't capture pregnant and breastfeeding women. The COVID control measures has affected maternal and neonatal health services uh, profoundly. And UNFPA data suggests a drop in facility-based care and uh, related rise in maternal mortality. The curfews have impacted access to healthcare and there's been redirection of healthcare workers to deal with COVID-19 infections. Uh, limited personal protective equipment has exposed workers to uh, COVID-19 infection and pregnant moms to infection. Now these measures have directly affected Kenyatta National Hospital, whereby there was a drop in antenatal uh, clinic attendance by half in 2020, though there has been a gradual increase in 2021 as the country reopens. Now, the figures I have mentioned can be explained by mothers uh, staying away for fear of contracting COVID-19 in hospitals and healthcare workers uh, also minimized in-person contact with their patients. However, out of these uh, uh, innovations have come up like the Wheels for Life initiative between government of Kenya, AMREF and BOLD with a toll free number of 1196. Now the weak link with this is that some taxis conveniently avoid informal settlements fearing for, for their safety. And we have also realized that we have structural challenges at the hospital that was not initially designed for highly contagious condition. And I think this is repl replicated in many facilities in this country. So in view of the foregoing, the management uh, of uh, Kenyatta National Hospital planned ahead to cover four main areas. There has been revision of uh, triage protocols as evidence uh, emerges. And uh, initially we had cancellation of non-essential surgeries, procedures and visits, but I think this has since been revised. Um, we also reduced routine ultrasound scans and induction of labor was for strict indications. And other measures, including sterilizing doors, counters, rooms, handles, availing masks, and other PPEs, hand sanitizers at front desks and uh, strategic points in our hospitals, among other things. Now, despite all the measures that I've mentioned, some I may not have mentioned, but despite all those measures, like in all plagues, we have seen a lot of suffering during this plague. Though the numbers uh, may seem low, we show the trends and outcomes of patients with COVID-19 in pregnancy admitted in 2020 and 2021. The spikes mirror the waves that were reported in July and November 2020 and March 2021, but overall survival was good. However, I'd like to mention that those admitted to the critical care unit had high mortality. And I will now take us through the management that we have instituted in Kenyatta National Hospital. We have adhered to public health practices, which are broadly divided into three. One, uh, prevention measures, containment measures, and mitigation measures. And under prevention, the government has issued a statement that pregnant women should be vaccinated, and we are embracing this as a hospital. Now, this statement on vaccination of pregnant and breastfeeding women was guided by the Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society the, and Kenya Medical Association's position on vaccination of pregnant and breastfeeding women. 
We have also strengthened, uh, strengthened our surveillance uh, systems. And in regards to containment measures, we have been isolating sick women with COVID-19. In our antenatal, labor ward, and critical care unit, we are now implementing admission and surveillance protocols based on oxygen requirements as manifested by changing physiological parameters, which can be graded as normal values, yellow alert and red alert. Two uh, yellow and one red alert triggers an immediate doctor's evaluation. And in Kenyatta National Hospital, all pregnant women admitted with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 are offered prophylactic low molecular weight heparin unless delivery is expected within 12 hours. We use corticosteroids as part of prematurity treatment and for deteriorating patients. Now, the principles of delivery is based on uh, the gestational age uh, of the patient, uh, fetal status, or whether or not delivery will improve ventilation status. All deliveries below 34 weeks are offered magnesium sulfate for neural protection. And for cesarean section, we use spinal anesthesia with uh, cautious fluid management, basically to aim at a neutral balance. I will now present two sample cases of COVID-19 in pregnancy managed at uh, Kenyatta National Hospital. The first one uh, uh, is a, was a 40-year-old uh, gravida 4 para 3 plus uh, 0 presented to us at 27 weeks gestation by dates, sorry for the typo, and presented with cough for one week, chest pain and difficulty in breathing, breathing for four days. Now, this patient had been seen five days prior to presentation to our hospital and started on augment, augmenting azithromycin, folic acid and calcium with no improvement. Home monitoring SpO2 had been dropping from 93 to 86% on the day of admission. She had fever and chills. She also reported reduced sense of taste and smell and uh, constipation for five days. On examination, she was sick looking in respiratory distress. Her respiratory rate was 22. SpO2 was 91 uh, on room air, temperature 37.6. Blood pressure was 135 over 92 and a heart rate of 102. She also had basal crepitations with reduced breath sounds on the right. At that time, an impression of moderate COVID-19 pneumonia at 27 weeks of pregnancy was made. She was admitted and started on oxygen at four liters per minute by nasal prongs. She was started on clexane and she had been on zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, paracetamol, and dexamethasone, six milligrams IV, 12 hourly for 48 hours. At this point, I'd like to mention that there is no evidence that azithromycin or zinc or vitamin D are effective against COVID-19. On day four, this patient had two convulsions and an elevated blood pressure. A diagnosis of eclampsia was made. She was immediately started on antihypertensives and magnesium sulfate. And one stable was taken in for an emergency cesarean section where a live female weighing 1.1 kilos was extracted. Uh, the baby did well in our newborn unit. The patient was discharged home after 11 days. Our second case is MW, 28-year-old, Gravida for para three plus not with uh, three previous cesarean section deliveries at 31 weeks. She presented to us with a two day history of cough and chest pain. Uh, she had been on follow up at our antenatal clinic for chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia with severe features. Uh, she had chills, uh, fever, and difficulty in breathing. On examination, she was sick looking, not in respiratory distress. Her respiratory rate was 12, SpO2 was 90 on room air with bilateral basal crepitations. Her fundal height was 30 weeks. Fetal heart rate was hard and regular. At this point, an impression of COVID-19 pneumonia at 31 weeks gestation in a woman with three prevent cesarean section deliveries uh, was made. Uh, management instituted was um, antihypertensive, which she had been on, and this was continued. She was also started on azithromycin, dexamethasone, and, uh, and clexane, which is a low molecular weight heparin. Her oxygen saturations continued to deteriorate 
drastically in, uh, on day four of admission. However, all the critical care unit beds were occupied at that point, and we did not have an opportunity to manage this patient in critical care unit. She succumbed with her fetus in utero. Now, imaging evidence shows that there is benefit of uh, using remdesivir for pregnant women with COVID-19 who are deteriorating and uh, not improving. And also uh, tocilizumab among other targeted uh, therapies. However, the cost of these drugs is quite uh, prohibitive, especially for our patients who can hardly afford even some of the basic drugs that sometimes we use uh, for other conditions in pregnancy. However, I'm looking forward to the final results of the solidarity trial. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wende, for the beautiful presentation. Uh, now we just uh, just a reminder that we can post your questions uh, or any comments in the question and answer session, but any other comments on the chat box area. Uh, let me take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, Dr. Teshome Desta is a medical officer in the child and adolescent health at the WHO Afro region in Harare, that's intercountry support team for the East and Southern Africa. And ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, it's my pleasure now to invite uh, Dr. Mercedes Bonnet. Dr. Mercedes Bonnet is a perinatal health epidemiologist based in the Department of Sexual Reproductive Health and Research at the WHO office in Geneva, Switzerland. She has an extensive experience in global health with a particular interest in care during childbirth and postnatal period the maternal infections and sepsis. She is currently leading the WHO's evidence synthesis and normative work in the COVID, on COVID-19 and pregnancy. Mercedes, uh, we say karibu, say welcome in Kenya. And go ahead and make your presentation. Thank you. Um, many thanks and thanks uh, for um, this invitation and to all for, um, for joining. I um, will present um, results from um, a living systematic review on COVID and pregnancy that um, we are leading um, from um, WHO um, in uh, my department, Sexual Reproductive Health and Research in Geneva and uh, in close collaboration with the uh, University of Birmingham in, in the UK. Um, next slide. So uh, very early in the pandemic, um, early uh, last year, we set up um, a group um, to um, do this living systematic review to look at um, any evidence around suspected of confirmed cases of COVID-19 among pregnant or recently pregnant women. So women after a miscarriage and abortion or a postpartum. Um, with the aim to um, um, gather information around prevalence, clinical presentation, also risk factors, mother to child transmission, diagnosis and treatment of um, sick um, women. So um, for um, the last 18 um, months, we have been um, updating our searches monthly and doing regular analysis, focusing on those um, these different uh, topics. Um, and uh, we have already published two updates of the Living Systematic Review in BMJ, one um, last year and one where I will be presenting more of, of the data in a March um, this year. Next. So as you can see on this slide, um, clinical manifestations of COVID-19 in pregnant women are very similar to those in the general population. They will present mainly with cough or fever, difficult breathing, and some um, laboratory um, abnormalities. Um, however, I wanted um, to note that uh, most of the studies that we have so far uh, involve only pregnant women who are admitted to hospital, either 
because of their um, health condition or because um, in labor. And we have very few or less information on um, uh, postpartum, of course, abortion and um, COVID-19 disease. Uh, also to note is that those symptoms seem to be less frequent in pregnant and recently pregnant women. So they might be presented in general with mild disease or even asymptomatic disease when we compare them to um, same um, group of uh, women, same age group of um, women. Next one. However, when um, they are symptomatic, uh, they are more likely to develop severe disease. And um, can you just click again on this slide just to show in the table? Just, yeah, no. Yeah, that, perfect. Um, as you can see um, on, on the table, um, when there's two types of studies that we can look at to, um, to know if there are three risks of um, having adverse outcomes. So there's um, a bunch of studies that have compared non-pregnant women with COVID with pregnant women with COVID. And then there's other core studies comparing pregnant women with and without the disease. And what those studies shows is that um, Pregnant women with COVID are more likely to require ICU admission and mechanical ventilation when you compare them with a same age group um, of women uh, who are not pregnant, but had the disease. And um, similarly, when we compare pregnant women with and without COVID, what we see is that those pregnant women with COVID-19 um, may have increased um, all cause mortality and may require more often ICU admission. Uh, we also were able to look at um, risk factors of um, variables that might be associated with severe <clears throat> COVID-19 in pregnancy. And uh, what we found are um, our results are very similar to those in the general population. So those women who had pre-existing comorbidities, uh, who were older uh, from minority groups or not white ethnicity in mainly in high income countries or obese, uh, were at higher risk of developing severe disease. Next slide. Um, since we published our re um, living systematic review, there have been um, other studies, um, mainly in the US, the UK, and um, the Villars study that also includes some uh, low middle income countries that have um, confirmed those results and show increased mortality and maternal severe outcomes um, among pregnant women with COVID disease. There has been also um, some ecological analysis um, looking in the UK, India, and Brazil at different time periods. And um, what it seems to be happening is that there's an um, increased proportion of a pregnant women presented with severe infection uh, when um, in these countries, people have compared uh, periods of the new variants, so from late 2020, with um, what was happening at the beginning of the pandemic during um, last year. Um, and uh, there has been also um, studies suggesting that there's an association between um, SARS-CoV-2 infection during pregnancy and preeclampsia, also still very uh, controversial, but there might be some um, physiopathological explanations uh, to this association um, related mainly to, um, for example, endothelial damage or um, inflammation uh, that might um, may pregnant women more prone to develop preeclampsia. And what we certainly know is that those women who had any comorbidity, either chronic or uh, pregnancy related, are at higher risk of developing severe disease. Next one. 
And what about adverse birth and perinatal outcomes? And here, um, looking at the same type of studies, comparing pregnant women with and without the disease, can you just click again to, uh, so to show the results in the table, thanks. Um, what we see is that those pregnant women with COVID-19 will have higher rates of any preterm birth, so um, either a spontaneous or um, induced preterm birth. Um, their babies will have um, a higher admissions to neonatal units. Also, sometimes this is um, not because the baby clinically needs the, that, but um, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, it was more uh, for observation of um, those babies. Um, there's um, some studies that um, suggest, and we can see um, um, on, on the table, higher rates of stillbirths, and, uh, but uh, numbers are very small and it's difficult still to make um, sense to that. And same thing for uh, neonatal deaths. There seems not to be a difference in neonatal death when we compare pregnant women with and without COVID, but again, numbers are still very small. And similarly to uh, maternal um, outcomes, uh, more recent studies have also showed this increased uh, preterm birth and other adverse neonatal outcomes. Um, among their uh, populations. Again, mainly um, these are studies in, in the UK, US, and um, the multi country study from uh, Villar. Next one. So, um, these results are not yet uh, published, um, but uh, as part of the living systematic review, we also analyze information around a mother to child transmission. So um, looking at data up to end of March this year, and um, this includes over um, 100 studies, more than um, 11,000 mother baby diets. What we found is that SARS-CoV-2 positivity in babies born to infected mothers seems to be low, around 2%. And this is either a PCR positive test or an um, antibody test done at any time um, close to um, the time of, uh, of birth and from any neonatal sample. The problem that we have with um, this information is that in most of the cases, um, either babies presented with no symptoms and there were not confirmatory tests done. So it is very difficult to translate these positivity rates into um, real, let's say, infections in the baby. So all to say that this has to be interpreted uh, with uh, caution. Um, we also look at um, any type of a study, including a case um, reports or case series that look at um, detection by PCR of uh, SARS-CoV-2 in any body fluid or tissues. And um, again, posit um, positive tests in any tissue were um, rare. Um, and this included, for example, amniotic fluid, placental, biopsies, swabs, vaginal fluid, um, neonatal peripheral blood, uh, fecal samples, and um, breast milk. Um, we were also able to look at what will be risk factors for babies to present with a positive uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, test um, after, right after birth. And uh, what we found is that if the, the mother had severe COVID disease um, or what, for example, admitted to ICU or she died, babies had higher, um, uh, there was a higher proportion of babies having a positive test. And the same if um, the woman presented with infection um, postnatally in the first days or weeks after uh, the birth. 
However, there was no variation in terms of uh, the gestation of the infection, the mode of delivery, whether it was vagina or C-section, or whether um, she was breastfeeding or separated from um, the baby at birth. Um, the last analysis that we did with this set of information was to try to look whether we could um, say that some of these babies have a confirmed infection. And again, this um, happens. And um, we look at around 600 diets um, uh, for uh, this analysis. Half of them presented with enough information and repeated tests uh, for us to, uh, to be able to say that the baby was not only um, exposed to the virus, but also got um, the infection. Um, in total, um, 13 cases um, so far, we were able to say that have confirmed vertical transmission. Half of them uh, happened in utero and um, very few during an um, intrapartum period with um, around five that happened in the early uh, postnatal period on the first um, days after um, birth. Next slide. So um, key messages um, from my presentation is that typical COVID-19 symptoms may manifest less frequently in pregnant or recently pregnant women when we compare them to um, a, a general adult population, especially non-pregnant reproductive age women. Um, pregnant women with COVID might be at increased risk of requiring intensive care and need respiratory support when they uh, develop symptomatic uh, COVID-19 um, infection. And there's also more and more data that suggests that they might also have increased risk of uh, death um, associated with a COVID infection. Um, they are also more likely to be delivered um, preterm and their babies to be admitted to um, neonatal units. Risk factors for severe COVID-19 infection include um, increased maternal age, obesity, being from a min minority uh, group, pre-existing comorbidity, and pregnancy-specific um, disorders. And as far as we know now, overall rate of SARS-CoV-2 positivity in babies born to mothers with COVID-19 um, seems to be low, as well as um, mother to child transmission um, in the cases that we could uh, confirm from the evidence available so far seems to be um, rare. Next one. So I um, put at the end of my presentation some additional resources uh, for you with links to uh, different WHO um, documents that I thought uh, will be um, useful for you to have. And um, I uh, just wanted to thank um, the Living Systematic Group um, that have been working very hard in the last um, year and a half uh, to gather um, this information. And um, just to let you know that we hope that um, before the end of the year, we will have um, a new update of um, our Living Systematic Review looking at outcomes and also publish the results on uh, mother to child um, transmission. Thanks for um, your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Mercedes, for the great presentation. And that lays good ground for the next session, which is now speaking in a response to the evidence that has been, that you have shared with us, and also for the experiences that many of our colleagues here have had in their clinical practice. And I just really remind ourselves that we have great experts local and from within the country. We have Professor Mondio Kutu, Professor Wanyoro, Mary Beth Maritin, Dalton Omalwa, Alfred Dosotti, just to mention a few amongst many others with us who will be able to respond to some of the questions that you do have. Um, just to inform you that the chat box has been locked, so you use Q&A uh, platform to ask your questions or make any comments. Um, colleagues, 
Yeah, now it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Shalini Desai, who is a medical officer in the Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals Department at the WHO Geneva. She is currently seconded at the Secretariat of SAGE to work with the expert group on evidence-based policy for the COVID-19 vaccines. So once again, let's say Karibu, uh, Dr. Shalini. Um, good morning, everyone in Karibu. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak um, to you today. Um, what I'd like to do in the next um, 15 minutes or so is provide an update on the WHO interim recommendations on COVID-19 vaccination of pregnant and breastfeeding women. Next slide, please. So just by way of an outline, so you know where we're going and, and the topics that we will cover, um, I'll start off with a bit of a background on the evidence that we have and on how decisions get made um, through WHO. We'll talk about WHO interim recommendations in pregnancy and also in breastfeeding. We'll look at the global tracking of policies and we'll look at the safety surveillance that should be used. And then finally, I do have some tools and resources that I hope you'll find useful. Next slide, please. So in terms of the process for how WHO makes its policy recommendations on immunizations, we have a group uh, called the SAGE group. So the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization. They comprise a group of international experts that independently review the evidence and then provide an assessment. Since January of 2021, we've been having video meetings approximately monthly. Normally, um, when in non-COVID times, we have two face-to-face uh, -face meetings. Behind the, the, those, those meetings, um, our SAGE COVID-19 working group and the subgroups meet two to three times per week in order to review evidence and in order to create um, global policy. This group reports directly to the Director General of WHO. I've put the link in um, for anyone that's interested in learning more about our experts on SAGE or the process um, that SAGE uses. And it also has information on any upcoming meetings that you may wish to attend. Now, if we look at COVID-19 technical documents, oh, sorry, back, back one slide, please. Back one more. Thank you. Um, so the technical documents that we have um, through WHO and SAGE include six product specific interim recommendations. And those are the six WHO um, emergency use listed vaccines that have been approved. We also have generic guidance for policy making on COVID-19 vaccines. We have a whole section on further resources, and that's not created by our SAGE group, but actually a separate group um, that has lots of input from other stakeholders, so our uh, country readiness and delivery teams, and that has vac vaccine introduction toolkits, and that helps with operationalizing the recommendations that the SAGE makes. We also have a roadmap um, for prioritization of the use of COVID-19 vaccines in the context of limited supply, which is what most of the world is, is um, working under at the moment. And pregnancy um, is one of the prioritizing um, groups, prioritized groups. Um, and then we have other COVID-related guidance re related to things like gender. Um, I've put a link in uh, for all of those materials. Next slide, please. So what is the evidence related to um, COVID-19 vaccines in pregnant and breastfeeding women? The initial trials um, did not include breastfeeding or pregnant women, but trials are underway. And as we've had rollout of these vaccines in different countries, we are seeing more safety data that's becoming available. Many of these studies are being conducted in high income countries. And for that reason, a lot of the data that we have is related to the mRNA vaccines. So knowing that we have a limited amount of, of data at present, if we go back and think about first principles, 
um, related to COVID-19 vaccines, we realize that um, none of these vaccines, none of the WHO um, emergency use listed ones, are live virus vaccines. So the risk to pregnant or breastfeeding women, to anyone actually, of getting COVID as a result of these vaccines is, is it doesn't exist, right? Because it's not a live a virus vaccine. Data from post-introduction surveillance studies and from animal studies have shown that there are no harmful effects in pregnancy, have not shown that. Um, and vaccine effectiveness is likely to be comparable to non-pregnant women, and our initial immunogenicity data has been similar between pregnant women and non-pregnant women. Next slide, please. So WHO recommends vaccination in pregnant women when the benefits of vaccination um, to the pregnant women outweigh the potential risks. The examples that we provide include pregnant women in areas of high transmission or individuals at high risk of exposure to COVID-19 or women with comorbidities that place them in high risk groups for severe COVID-19. And again, there's a link there to help with um, the exact um, recommendations by product. Next slide, please. So how do we enable pregnant women's choices through a benefit risk assessment? Pregnant women should be provided with information about the risks of COVID-19 in pregnancy. And I think um, Mercedes provided an overview of what the literature says about those risks. Next would be the likely benefit of vaccination in the local epidemiologic context. And Philomena was able to provide um, the local ep epidemiologic context in Kenya and the currently available safety data in pregnant women. It's not necessary to conduct a pregnancy test prior to vaccination, and there's no need to delay or terminate pregnancy because a vaccination has been received. Next slide, please. As I mentioned in one of my previous slides, we also have a toolkit to help health workers as they counsel pregnant women. This is just a screenshot of a job aid that was created along with partners to help um, health workers. And so on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see um, the questions that we would ask. And then on the other side, in that lime green box, we have specific questions as well as answers that can be provided to pregnant women as they make a decision about um, vaccination. Next slide, please. Our recommendations for breastfeeding um, and COVID-19 vaccinations are presented on this slide. We know that breastfeeding has a substantial health benefit to both mothers and infants. Vaccine effectiveness is expected to be similar in breastfeeding women as in other adults. There's currently no data on the safety of COVID-19 vaccines in breastfeeding women or their breastfed infants. However, it is unlikely to pose a risk to either the breastfeeding woman or to the child. On the basis of these considerations, WHO recommends vaccination in breastfeeding women as in other adults. WHO does not recommend discontinuing breastfeeding because of vaccination. Next slide, please. This provides a global tracking of national in pregnant women. This was updated on September 1st, um, so just recently. And I note that um, Kenya is one of the countries in gray and so does not appear to have a policy recommendation as yet for pregnant women. As we can see, 34 countries have recommendations for some or all pregnant women. 46 um, have a permissive statement. Um, 31 have a permissive statement with some qualifications. 11 have uh, not recommended, but they have exceptions um, that are specific to risk groups. And then 30 countries do not recommend. Next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to highlight safety surveillance. Um, that um, should be put in place 
Um, so this is a new module that's meant to be added to the vaccine safety surveillance for COVID-19 in general. Immunization programs are encouraged to establish surveillance of women who have been vaccinated either intentionally or inadvertently during pregnancy and of their infants. We recommend that both active and passive surveillance approaches are used in order to assess adverse events following immunization, including those during pregnancy. We hope that um, systems that are already in place, so for example, the AFI system that Kenya already has for um, infant programs can be leveraged um, and used for pregnant women as well as their infants. Next slide, please. Here's some additional resources um, and um, uh, topics that you may wish to read more about, um, and they're provided um, just for your reference. Next slide, please. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Shalini. And uh, now may also acknowledge the presence. We just logged in, uh, Dr. Bashir Isaac, who is the head of Family Health at the Ministry of, of Health, Department of Family Health at the Ministry of Health, Kenya. So as we get into the next phase, I'll give the difficult task to my senior, Dr. Maureen Owiti who is the head of department at the Kenyatta National Hospital. Dr. Marilyn, will you take over the next session for the questions and answers, and also feel free to share with the, amongst the panelists where possible. Thank you. Uh, very good, Dr. Thank you very Oiti. much, Dr. Koro. Uh, as far as I remember, you're my senior. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. I think to all the presenters, those were fantastic presentations. I have immensely enjoyed them. And I hope the audience uh, with us has also enjoyed the presentations. We are presently at the question and answer session. I've been checking in the chat group. Um, and uh, as I see for the time being, they do not appear. Let me just see if there are question and answer. They do not appear to be any question and un questions being raised in the group. Um, I would like, I don't know if we are able to. There are 27, to, yes? there, there are 27 there are questions. 27. My goodness. In the QA, &A, Q &A, sorry. No, oh, sorry, I can Q &A. see. Q &A. Okay, fine. QA. &A. Thank you very much. So I will start with a um, question from Moses Alobo. Uh, is it possible to provide, uh, I think it's estimate of the case fatality of COVID pregnancy in Kenya, and what is the prognosis of a positive diagnosis in pregnancy? Um, I think it would be possible. Um, I don't know, maybe Dr. Wende, you can take that. And I think Dr. Bashir is here with us. I don't know if we can also add him onto the panel. Uh Yes, but maybe Dr. Maritim, Dr. Bashir is attending uh, something as we as, as a good Okay, sir. Yeah, so. Dr. Koro? Yes, please proceed. I think it has been given to you. Okay, I don't seem to have the national pregnancy data. So unless uh, you have from uh, UNFPA, uh, you could respond to this question. But in our institution, it's about 2%. I'll ask my Dr. Maritim, but uh, there has been a challenge in, in doing the analysis of sub-analysis of the data, the national data on the, on the burden of the, that's, the, that's among the pregnant, pregnant women. Uh, I think that we've requested that from the national team, but uh, unless uh, Dr. Maritim, Mary Beth, do you have any Yeah, response? thank you, Dan. Yeah, thank you, Dan, for, for the question. And I have to agree, I don't have an answer because uh, it's actually some information I'm also looking for in terms of uh, what is provided in the line list. I think initially there was um, the pregnancy status of uh, the person tested, particularly the women uh, would be indicated, but uh, with time it has, uh, I think this data is currently missing. Uh, but I hope we'll have it in the near future so that we can really ascertain what's the case fatality rate, what's the burden of disease, so that we can have as part of uh, 
the national statistics and even what is declared maybe on a daily basis. But I don't have, we don't have the data at the moment. Okay, thank you. Dr. Uh, Koro. Next... Dr. Dr. Witi. Uh, Professor Mondio Gutu, thank you. I think probably you can give your input. I think the, yeah, the figures I was able to get as of uh, the month of August is about 2.9%. Okay, thank you very much. Is, is that for Kenya or is that, is, is that for Kenya or worldwide? Yeah, for Kenya. For Kenya. From okay, thank you very much. System. Yeah, so it health, seems to be similar to what we're seeing. Kenya health in information Yata. system. Thank you very much, Professor. So, uh, what is? I think this will go to yeah. Dr. Shalini. What is the recommended vaccine for expectant breastfeeding mothers now that we shall have varieties in our country? Um, thank you uh, for that question. Um, at this stage, uh, WHO SAGE does not have any preferential um, recommendations because um, different countries will have different vaccines available. Um, the most um, safety data and... Um, Hello. Hello. Morning. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Professor, Sit. Professor Mondia Gut, if you could just mute while we listen to the answer. Uh, uh, please proceed, Shalini. Sorry about of that. Course. No problem. Um, is, are, is related to the mRNA vaccines. Um, that's not to say that other vaccines are not safe in pregnancy. It's just that we're in the process of accruing that information. So I think that um, in terms of thinking this through for Kenya, it would be important for Kenya NITAG, so the National um, uh, Immunization Technical Advisory Group, to take a look at what products are available in Kenya, and then they would be able to, to best guide. Over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shalini. The next is from an anonymous attendee who has appreciated the forum and is asking that high molecular heparin has, uh, is being used um, uh, to all mothers in maternity wing. Is there any benefit to the mothers? Kindly advise. I think maybe Mercedes, just for the panel to be all active. Okay, Dr. Owende, if you could take that. Thank you, Dr. Witi, for that question. And um, we know that there's a tendency to hypercoagulation in pregnancy and uh, thrombembolic events are generally very common. Now to that, if you add COVID infection in pregnancy, it uh, I think doubles or even triples that risk of uh, thrombembolic events. So the optimal thromboprophylaxis uh, regimen in patients with COVID-19 in pregnancy. I don't think it's I don't think it's known because of the you know drug to drug interactions uh, with uh, some of the anticoagulants. So the unfractionated or low molecular weight heparins uh, may actually be used in uh, pregnant women. We lost you, Dr. Witte. Dr. Yes, Koros? Yes, okay. Thanks, 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 uh, Dr. Wende. Uh, I think that's, uh, that should answer it. Sorry. Sorry, yes, go ahead, go, continue. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. I don't know how my mute button got, uh, whatever. Uh, the question was, um, if a woman tests negative uh, and had co uh, COVID-19, how long should they take before the next jab, before her first jab of the vaccine? Shalini? Sorry, could I just ask you to repeat that question? Uh, yes, Shalini. So they are, if a pregnant mother tested yeah. had COVID-19 uh, COVID infection, mm -hmm. recovers and now has tested negative, how yeah. soon can she get the vaccine after a COVID-19 infection? Thank you. Um, so 
um, what we recommend is that um, once an individual has recovered from acute illness and the criteria for discontinuation of isolation is met, they can go ahead and be vaccinated. Um, there, we also talk about, um, we know that there is data for approximately six months after you've had uh, COVID-19, you appear to have protection against subsequent um, infections. And so in cases of severely limited supply, you could um, wait to have those individuals um, vaccinated. Um, the one caveat that I would give with that is that as um, the pandemic evolves, um, the data also changes. So it's, it's important to, to remember that this is a ongoing and evolving um, situation and therefore the recommendations are also ongoing and evolving. Over. Thank you, Dr. Shalini. The next question is, how do we manage an infant of one to two weeks old with COVID? I don't know if you have any pediatricians on or Dr. Koro, if you're strong enough to take that one. For well, sure not, but I saw Dr. Mwanda, I don't know that she, he's still with us. We also have Dr. Anne-Marie. Oh, Dr. Anne-Marie, okay, fine. Yeah, Dr. Anne-Marie. Oh, my um, God. Hi. <laughs> yes, hi, how are you? Fine. Um, Please proceed. Well, I can respond to that question because I've uh, managed a number of neonates. I think we've had about uh, five children who have been less than 28 days old who had a positive COVID result. I'd say luckily many of these children have been very stable. Um, and in fact, were only swabs because their mothers had a positive COVID test. So while we observed them in the, um, in the IDU, uh, four of them were completely asymptomatic. One did have symptoms of pneumonia, uh, but did well just on oxygen. We did give that particular baby uh, steroids, but the baby did well. We've not had any mortality, at least in care in that age group due to COVID. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anne-Marie. Our next question, that uh, question was from Dennis Angeri. The next question is Jacqueline Rotich. Uh, give Dr. Wende, uh, what is your advice on vaccine uptake in a woman who is eight weeks postpartum and had eclampsia uh, post-delivery currently um, with well-controlled blood pressures? Thanks, Maureen, and thanks, Jacqueline. I think this has been answered uh, uh, by the previous uh, presenter on uh, COVID vaccination in pregnancy, that uh, this woman can be offered vaccination in the piperium. Thank you, Dr. Tari. So what are the chances of a patient with a chronic um, pulmonary disease, obstructive pulmonary disease, contracting a severe illness in COVID? Anonymous? Maybe Mary Beth can answer. Yes, Mary Beth. Please repeat the question, Maureen. Uh, what are the chances of a patient with COPD contracting severe illness in COVID? So in um, COVID-19 illness, we already know a lot of patients who have underlying comorbidity who are at risk of, um, once they get infected, they can develop severe and critical illness. And having underlying respiratory uh, disease, such as in this case, COPD, is one of such risk factors. So the chances are very high. And these are the uh, group of people who have been prioritized for vaccination to prevent um, progression to severe disease. So the chances are very high. Okay, there's a 
question here. Thank you very much, uh, Mary Beth. There's a question here from one of our seniors, Professor Lemma. Um, I don't know whether the question would be race. I, ho I, I hope that's the question, but what is the relevance of the woman's color vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19 mobility and mortality? So I, be I believe that's race. Maybe Mercedes? Sure. Um, so um, as far as I'm aware, there's no direct link with uh, race, but what we see, and, and this, this is mainly data coming from uh, high income countries, is that um, people from minority groups, from um, low socio um, economic uh, groups in these settings are at higher risk both of um, presenting with the disease, right? So getting um, infected, um, or might be also because they are at, um, they have higher rates of exposure to um, to sick people, given um, the living conditions or the the, the work that they do. Um, and also they are at higher risk of presenting a severe COVID disease. Um, we also know that these groups in high income settings are at higher risk of have comorbidities such as obesity or um, hypertension, which at the same time uh, put them at higher risk of um, severe um, disease. Thank you. Um, I think we've talked on the issue of anticoagulants, but um, um, Mary Beth, does a woman who tested positive for COVID-19 two weeks ago still require anticoagulants? I think that would be severe COVID. Uh, I think this has already been covered uh, mm -hmm. and answered by Dr. Wende. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in outside of pregnancy, our indications for anticoagulants are related to uh, being admitted, being, having severe disease and being admitted in hospital and uh, having oxygen. But outside of that, then within the setting of pregnancy, maybe I'd defer the question to Dr. Wende to just give us a sense um, in terms of how long would you anticoagulate? What is, is there ongoing risk? And how do you manage, uh, how do you uh, minimize the risk through anticoagulation? So let me ask Dr. Wende, maybe just to, uh, chip in. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mary team. Yes, we covered this in the presentation, but generally all women who have been hospitalized and have had confirmed COVID-19 or those up to six weeks uh, postpartum are offered thromboprophylaxis for 10 days following hospital discharge. But, you know, a longer duration may be offered or considered for women with persistent morbidity. We lost a witty. My Oops. phone keeps going on mute. Sorry, uh, there's a question from Tessa Mkutu. Uh, do we consider blood group to be a predictor of COVID-19 infection? Mm. Uh, Mercedes? Oh. Uh, so I'm aware that there have been some studies suggesting that there might be um, some blood groups um, that might um, put people at higher risk of um, COVID or protect them. Uh, but I don't think that this have been um, so far um, confirmed as a risk factor, either for um, higher um, rates of infection or um, adverse outcomes related to COVID. Thank you, Mercedes. Uh, the next question is, uh, why does severe COVID-19 infection appear to be more prevalent in the third trimester? Uh, yeah, Professor Gutu can and Onyo. Yeah, Professor Gutu, yeah. Thank you. It is true because you know, within the, when you get to the third trimester, because the embolic phenomena tend to increase and most of the severity is in two, two stages. You have to look at the severity in terms of the fetal outcome and also the severity in terms of the maternal because you see all the cardiovascular system and all the, the 
the physiological changes peaks at this time. And when you get those peak in case you get infection, therefore, remember the positioning of the uterus pushes the, the, the diaphragm up, therefore you reduce your residual volume. So the respiratory aspect gets compromised and the severe effect of the disease kicks in. This translates into what happens in the placenta. You get hypoperfusion because of the inflammatory process which takes place because you have vasculitis and therefore all that inflammation within the placenta therefore affects the babies. And this will explain two factors. One, why we get a lot of uh, preterm births and especially, you know, preterm births are in two places. Let me just ask, add on to this because it had been mentioned earlier. 6% of preterm births are usually spontaneous. A number of the preterm baths tend to be iatrogenic or provide the initiative. Professor, your network seems to be dropping. Oh dear. I'm, I'm I, hearing I'm that. Is, is okay, maybe check Maureen, maybe on your side. Prof, is okay. Can you hear me clearly now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so actually, the, you're also clear on my side. Okay. The preterm birth issue is because 6% are usually uh, spontaneous. And the rest of the preterm baths tend to become intragenic, iatrogenic, meaning provider initiated, so that you can be able to have a better outcome in management of the patient in order to reduce the severity component as you are managing these patients. Now, for the babies, I've mentioned about the placental events causing hypoperfusion because of the uh, derangement in placental function. So all these two factors tend to make the pregnancy more severe within the third trimester. And that's where when you get these patients a bit earlier and you institute medic medication or you do an earlier delivery, then the progress of the severity may be curtailed or might be lessened in these patients. So early picking up of those symptoms and instituting, making a decision as to whether there's a need to intervene or not. So the decision is usually individualized in the patient. And the experience of looking after this kind of patients come into play, whereby you look at what is it that you need to do earlier on so that you'll be able to reduce the severity in your patients and you get better patient discharge rate. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I'm just going through the questions. Uh, a lot of them are repetitions. Uh, there was just a question regarding uh, for to Dr. Wende regarding the second patient. Why did she appear to be on uh, therapeutic doses vis-a-vis -vis prophylactic dose? Okay. The one who I Yes, I summarized the case and I did not put uh, the imaging that we did for this patient. We had a chest x-ray for the patient and a, a CT scan for this particular patient. And it confirmed that uh, she had uh, palmarite thromboembolism. And that is why she was on uh, the therapeutic doses in consultation with the cardiologist and the chest physicians who were seeing her at that time. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wende. Um, very tricky. Okay, so there's a patient, um, anonymous attendee, who says, I have COVID-19 currently at 33 weeks and five days. I have been advised to take uh, budenoside, aspirin, Ascoril and chloroquine. Is this safe in pregnancy? I'm worried about how it will affect the baby. I did not get vaccinated. Um, Dr. Witi, what drugs are getting? From Professor, Professor Mojaguto. Um, the patient is on, oh goodness. Uh, it was budenoside, ascoril, and aspirin at 33 weeks gestation. 
and she's worried about uh, the safety and um, I think uh, also the fact that she has COVID-19. Professor? I think on the drug she's taking, budenoside, what duration has she been on the drug? Uh, it, has, it has not been indicated, but she's currently having a COVID-19. I think she's um, mildly symptomatic because appears to be on home-based care. I don't think that one she should be safe. She should not be worried because okay. it's quite safe. Yeah. The, only thing, okay. yeah. the only thing we need to watch out is of uh, uh, the aspirin at this time. I don't know what dose of aspirin is she taking. Uh, 75. Okay. That, that's low dose. That... Uh, Dr. Wendy, add... you add something? Yes, I'd like to add on to what Professor Mondi Ogutu has said, that yes, we'd want to watch for the aspirin, especially say for admitted patients who are on aspirin and low molecular weight heparin, you might want to drop the aspirin for such patients and continue with low molecular weight So for this particular patient, it, it, in order, because she seems to be on home-based care, to continue with the aspirin. However, there is a hydro, uh, what did it say, chloroquine that she is getting. And uh, I don't think there seem to be um, a lot of evidence on its effect on uh, COVID-19 pregnancy. So I would drop it. And continue with the rest of the treatment. Why is she on hydroxychloroquine? I don't, maybe, maybe better. The ID specialist will come in. I don't think it's one of our treatment protocols. Is she one of those who are doing their own home-based uh, therapeutic uh, medications? I think the value of this forum, Professor, so that uh, we all come up to speed, um, I think it has been shown that uh, the hydroxychloroquine has no uh, therapeutic value in COVID-19 uh, infection. Um, Mary Beth, you are being asked. Maybe you can comment on the same. Yeah, so we currently don't have evidence for hydroxychloroquine. And I know in the same breath, even ivermectin, azithromycin, specifically for COVID uh, use. So that patient should actually not be taking hydroxychloroquine. There was a lot of use of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, previously when we did not have evidence, but the clinical trials that have been done have shown that there is no benefit. So it probably in this case may be causing more harm than good, uh, particularly uh, for this lady who's pregnant. So she should stop it. Thank you, Mary Beth. I'm sorry, I'm on my phone. So it's giving me a lot of challenges. I have to scroll after every presenter. Um. um hello um this is sammy gottlieb i'm i'm um, yes sammy go ahead yes hi i just um wanted to address there are some questions that are coming up in the chat repeatedly um i uh, also work in the who headquarters in the department of sexual and reproductive um, health and research um, with uh, Dr. Uh, Mercedes. And so I, I just wanted to answer a few of these questions. One of them is um, people have been asking questions about the uh, trimester in which to vaccinate, or is there a preferential time to vaccinate um, against COVID? And um, SAGE, the WHO SAGE recommendations do not specify uh, one particular trimester for uh, vaccination over another. So pregnant women can be vaccinated at any time point during pregnancy. And I wanted to raise that um, we have quite a bit of uh, safety data uh, from the US. Uh, right now they have uh, a tracking system called vSafe in which they're tracking more than 150,000 um, pregnant women who have been vaccinated with COVID vaccines during pregnancy um, and haven't identified any um, safety signals. 
And just recently, they published a preliminary report looking at just those women in the tracking system who had been vaccinated early in pregnancy. And um, they did not see any um, difference in rates of miscarriage or other pregnancy outcomes. Um, they didn't see any difference with expected background rates in the general population. So um, right now we can say that um, it's safe to vaccinate pregnant women at any time point. And we know the, the um, increased risks of COVID during pregnancy and the safety data that we have so far, while we don't have clinical trial data, we have a lot of accumulating safety evidence um, that shows that COVID vaccination is safe. And so for most women who are in areas with uh, high um, community transmission or wh where there's um, COVID ongoing, that the benefits um, outweigh the risks at any time point uh, during pregnancy. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. And I think um, while we still have you online, uh, there were questions re related to the same. Are there any special consideration for adolescents? Uh, that is one. Uh, specifically, are the vaccines available effective against the Delta variant? And are there any side effects concerns uh, in the pregnant population? Great. Thank, thanks for those questions. I think for um, pregnant adolescents, um, um, the same guidance should follow um, as for pregnant adults in terms of the um, any person that is recommended to get the vaccine, um, any age group that's recommended to the vaccine um, would also be safe to receive the vaccine uh, during pregnancy um, when the benefits outweigh the risks. So any pregnant adolescents um, in settings where there's ongoing active um, community transmission of uh, COVID uh, can be vaccinated similar to adults. Um, so that's the first question. Um, the second question was about the Delta variant. So yes. uh, what we are seeing is that um, the vaccines that have been evaluated where there have been vaccine effectiveness studies um, looking at um, severe illness and death, um, we're seeing that the, the vaccinations are still um, protecting against severe illness and death in the setting of the Delta variant. There have not specifically been studies of pregnant women, um, vaccine effectiveness studies in pregnant women um, with respect to the Delta variant. Um, one thing that I will say is that currently um, there is a, a randomized controlled trial going on with the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine in pregnant women. Um, and so we will have some more data on um, safety, immunogenicity, and, and effectiveness uh, in this population. But so far, um, uh, although hundreds of thousands of women have pregnant women have received the vaccine, we don't have specific information about um, effectiveness with the Delta variant. But generally, we know that these vaccines are holding efficacy, effectiveness in terms of preventing the severe illness and death. Um, and just one more um, question that's come up quite a bit in the chat that I thought uh, I might also address while I'm speaking, if possible, um, is a question about um, uh, blood clots and um, thrombosis and the, the syndrome of TTS, the um, thrombotic thrombocytopenic um, syndrome that's been linked to um, the vaccines that use an adenovector, vector, uh, adenovirus vector, um, including the AstraZeneca and uh, Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccines. We, there has been noted an increase in um, blood clots. It's very rare, but has been noted in young people with these vaccines. Um, and we know independently that pregnancy is associated with an increased risk of blood clots. However, we 
do not have any information on whether um, there is an increase in blood clots in pregnant women um, specifically related to these vaccines. And from what we understand about the mechanisms of the TTS syndrome that is very rare, but has been linked to these vaccines and the type of um, blood clots that occur in pregnancy, they're completely different mechanisms. Um, and so there's no reason to expect that um, that particular mechanism would be more problematic in pregnancy, but we don't have specific uh, data on this. Um, the guidance still remains that the, the risk of blood clots associated with COVID so far outweigh the very rare um, risk of clots with these vaccines that um, still the benefits um, would outweigh the risk for any vaccine if, if a pregnant woman um, is in a setting where there's a lot of um, transmission ongoing. Does that, I, does that answer the question that people had about the uh, thrombosis? And, and with respect to one more thing I'd like to add about that is that at this point, SAGE, the WHO SAGE um, committee has not made any preferential um, recommendations for one type of vaccine over another. However, we do have the most safety data um, with the mRNA vaccines. Um, that's where we have these um, huge studies um, within countries like the US that are tracking um, the safety of you know, I have followed over 150,000 pregnant women in this tracking system who have received COVID vaccines during pregnancy. Um, but most of, of the women um, in, the, in those studies in that tracking system have received mRNA vaccines. This doesn't mean that the other vaccines um, are not safe, but it's just that we don't yet have um, the same degree of safety data that we do um, for the mRNA vaccines. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think before you go, uh, there's a question regarding patients on cancer treatment uh, and getting the vaccine when they're on active treatment. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Um, I think Shalini might have more information on this in general, as the SAGE committee has considered um, vaccination in um, people who are immunocompromised. Um, Shal Shalini? Um, so that would require a discussion with the individual physician because it depends on where you are in your cancer treatment. Essentially, what we do say is that like in terms of actual contraindications, specific um, uh, vaccines do have specific contraindications, right? So for example, um, anaphylaxis to any uh, component um, of a vaccine would be a contraindication. Um, but we know that um, immunocompromised individuals, older individuals are at higher risk of COVID. So it, it, it's hard to have, um, it, it's hard to provide a specific answer to a specific patient um, when you aren't seeing the patient. So it is a discussion that um, the oncologist and the patient need to have, because it depends on where they are in their um, treatment. Over? Does that answer the question actually, Maureen? Or, um, I think so. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, it's a tough question to answer because it just, it, it depends. Now, I don't know if you have anyone from ministry regarding our guidelines on vaccination. There's somebody who is concerned why we are not testing uh, for COVID-19 prior to vaccination. And is there, I think Mary Beth, you can take this. Is there any need to test for COVID-19 in asymptomatic patients who are going for vaccination? So in the, in the vaccine deployment uh, plan, we don't test people before getting the vaccine because that will introduce um, logistical um, 
difficulty and also would deny many people who actually um, would get vaccinated access to the vaccine because we know currently uh, even to get a COVID test, sometimes it may not be easy to get uh, a free COVID test and therefore you'll introduce where people have to pay some money to get the test before. So it introduces, it actually denies access to the vaccine. And therefore the guideline is that you do not need to test people uh, for COVID before deploying uh, the vaccine. And given that um, the vaccine now is available, it was just like to minimize the, 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 the handicap and delays that would come into uh, deploying uh, the vaccine. So that's really why we do not need to test uh, people be, uh, before deploying the vaccine. Um, Maureen, if I could also uh, just chime in, if that's okay. Oh, sure. Um, so just to um, reinforce what Beth has said, uh, WHO does not recommend uh, testing prior to providing vaccine um, to patients. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Mary Beth and Shalini. And I hope we all have that clear that we don't need to test prior to vaccinating asymptomatic patients, I mean, people who are coming for vaccination. Um, uh, Dr. Koro, if you could also just help me out to the question because I have to keep scrolling okay. back. Okay, thanks <laughs> That's a lot. That's why I'm uh, taking a bit of time. No, no worries, no worries. And, uh... I think this issue of questions of the guidelines or the, the national guidelines, I think this has not been developed, but clearly there's, there's a plan given the debate that is currently on. And I think this also will form a platform for us now to, to, to drive this agenda forward to have the guidelines, which will help uh, the health, other healthcare workers. I know we have a circular, we have um, those instructions given by the ministry regarding the vaccination, but the guidelines I think will be in the pipeline. Uh, when Dr. Bashir uh, comes on, he will be able to make that confirmation. In terms of the current uh, maternal sorry, mortality... Sorry, Dr. Koro, before you go, yes, uh, yes. just tell us uh, the circular from the ministry, because I know as COGS, yes, yes. Uh, we mm -hmm. came with a position statement. Uh, that's the Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society, for those who don't know. Um, our leadership came up with a position statement where we are recommending. Um, what is the circular from the ministry saying so that people get it clear? And I believe it's advocating for vaccination of pregnant women? I think the directive that was given, but uh, otherwise, uh, maybe when Dr. Bashir will have time, maybe he, will, can, he can make a statement, a comment on that. Other than that, we are not aware of any, unless Mary Beth, because even from the task force, I've not seen any other communication other than what was given earlier on regarding this. Mean, okay, no, there, no, maybe I can make a comment. Is there someone, someone, yes, someone is. Yes. Yeah, let me make a comment. This is Dr. Maritim. I have yeah. seen the, the advice from COGS. I have not seen a circular from Ministry of Health. I actually sit in Kenitag, which is the NITAG for the country. And we are actually waiting. Uh, so in the NITAG, we receive a question from the Ministry of Health that helps us to generate the policy recommendation. We are waiting for the question to address um, vaccination in pregnancy, because as many of you may be aware, this actually is a frequently asked questions when we have the vaccination webinar, because the training material uh, that was developed by the deployment task force initially actually said uh, pregnancy, uh, like for all uh, vaccination around pregnancy, you have to consult your healthcare, and therefore it actually uh, prolongs that decision making for um, the healthcare worker, because most often, the, the healthcare workers at the lowest level are not able to make that decision. And you find a lot of the time it's the gynecologist or us as ID specialists. And actually initially uh, we were using the risk benefit where you say if someone is frontline, then they probably need the vaccine. The benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risk. But when we are having an ongoing pandemic with a fourth wave and community transmission, we need really to have an advice that sort of informs um, the doctors at the lowest level or even the vaccinators at the facility. So as Kenitag, we are still waiting from the for the question from the Ministry of Health and hope we will have the question in the coming days uh, to uh, give us sort of like um, the requirements around the vaccine advice. So those, that's what I'd like to say at this point. Thank you. Uh, so I think we'll formulate the question. Uh, maybe Dr. Okoro, 
yes, yes, Professor Yes. I think this is one uh, thing that the ministry seems to be uh, failing us because most of the people on the ground, they still know that pregnant women are not being vaccinated. And we have had several pregnant women who are actually denied the vaccine when they go for vaccination. So the, I think the ministry needs to go further than the Cox statement so that it can come up with a policy which will inform the ground that it is acceptable to vaccinate all pregnant women so that this can be uptaken as quickly as possible. So as of now, what we are still having is the Cox statement which has only reached a very uh, small population. So if we can get some guidelines from the ministry disseminated to all the vaccination uh, at other health facilities, then we'll get more women who are pregnant and breastfeeding being vaccinated. Thank you. Thank very, you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wanyoro. I think you have taken the words uh, right out of my mouth and we need it as early as uh, yesterday because um, we're just talking with Dr. Wende when um, uh, we were asking her to make the presentation. And it, there's been a very big difference in terms of the initial wave. If we look at the pattern of patients we've had. In the first wave, pregnant women were contracting COVID, but unless they had a comorbidity, were not getting very bad outcomes. Majority of our pregnant women uh, had COVID, went home, came back to deliver, uh, very rarely were being admitted in ICU uh, without comorbidities. We are now seeing the reverse, whereby like uh, the first patient Dr. Wende talked about, I had the pleasure of managing, um, being part of the management for that particular patient. This is a patient who even the eclampsia she got, we believe was because of the COVID, because we've delivered this woman three times previously, with no history of preeclampsia in previous pregnancies. The only added risk factor that she had for preeclampsia was age, whereby she's now 40, if you compare to her previous pregnancies. Uh, she got COVID and got eclampsia. So this is at a very early gestation, 27 weeks. So it's something that I think needs to be taken urgently. If the ministry has not come up, I think um, they are here, let them hear our voices. As obstetricians, we are advocating that uh, women should receive the vaccine. I am fully behind the leadership of COGS. I think the only thing is that we can advance. And um, I think as a country, uh, we are, we are signature, signatories to uh, parties like WHO. And it says whereby if we don't have our own guidelines on the same, uh, international guidelines can take precedence. We have a WHO guideline recommending vaccination in pregnancy. I don't know, can we take it from here that the ministry just adopts the WHO position on the same? Thank you. Um, uh, Dan, Maureen, I don't know if you can see yes, any questions. Can we, request, yeah, can we request some of our colleagues, panelists to respond to, uh, to some of these in online? Uh, they type in the answers to some of them, the ones you can respond to. Uh, because I think we're overwhelmed with the time and uh, just to, a question which I can pop, do you separate the baby from the positive delivered as emergency to save the mother and after how long? Do you separate the baby from positive delivered? I think the pediatricians can take that, but as, um, uh, and Marie? Maureen, just to add my time. voice. Yes, yes, please. Uh, Maureen, ahead. this is a Wendy. I, I'd just like to add my voice onto the vaccination debate. And I think I did hear the minister, Mutai Kagwe, state that pregnant women can get vaccinated and that they had been in consultation with the Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society and KMA. So from the minister's mouth, I'm sure the government has uh, 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 people on the ground that uh, puts action to what is stated to the public. Uh, Dr. Wende, there's a process for that. You know, there was a statement says from the minister is one, then the, for the healthcare worker, they need something written, a guideline which goes on. So it will be the department, I think Dr. Bajir is listening, will initiate that process and have this done. Uh, I believe from the department and subsequently even for the division level. 
the, 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 two, the two divisions who take care of the mother and the one to take care of the babies so that this is actualized. I think this platform has provided that push, another push for it. So uh, we had asked to Dr. Anne-Marie about separation of the baby from the mother and how for how long if you do separate? Or do we ask Shalini or Sami? Yeah, Dr. Okora, I think uh, Anne-Marie may have dropped. I don't see okay. her on the, yes. Can you can you repeat the question, please? Separating the baby from the mother. Yeah, I can Positive. I can tell this one. Yes, Mercedes. This Mercedes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, Dorito does not recommend routine separation of um, the baby if the mother is positive. And um, I know that this might sound contradictory to um, all like isolation measures that have to be taken, but here we have to take in consideration that um, that grace balance for um, the mother baby diet is really in favor of keeping the, uh, them together, doing a skin to skin, uh, supporting her to breastfeed um, and so on. Of course, um, there might be situations where when the mother is too sick or the baby is too sick and um, this can be related to COVID or to other conditions. Um, regardless of um, her COVID status, and they might be to, um, to need to be separated for management. Um, but in general, the recommendation is to keep them together, share the same room, breastfeed, practice skin to skin. Of course, she has to follow all the um, infection prevention um, measures. Um, as um, any person with COVID, frequent hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, uh, clean and disinfect all surfaces um, that she has been in contact, including cleaning very well her breast before breastfeeding and wear a mask while she's um, taking care of, uh, of the baby. All right, thank you. First dose coagulation, one developed a coagulation. Can she receive a second dose? There's a fear to receive the second dose of vaccine against the COVID. Shalini? Somebody was given first dose of COVID vaccine. She was diagnosed to have developed uh, blood coagulation. What advice would you give to this patient? Because she um, fears going for the second. Uh, so I, I think um, Sammy has already uh, alluded to the answer to this. Um, so it's important to understand that um, blood clots do happen in pregnancy, but the mechanism um, for those that develop in pregnancy versus those that develop after a vaccine, um, after a specific vaccine, um, are different. And so it depends on what her first dose was. Um, I, I think that it, it, she needs to have a conversation with her physician can completely understand her hesitation for getting a, a second dose. Um, if it is indeed related to the vaccine, we don't recommend that she get a second dose. Over. Okay, thank you. Dr. Guaco, if you get a COVID in the third trimester, is it advisable to take dexamethasone injection in case the baby has to be born early? Dr. Guaco. Or, okay, Professor Nyoro, maybe, come. Yeah, maybe the uh, doc is not around. I come, think come on. The, uh, you can hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, what I'm saying is that I, I don't think dexamethasone would be contraindicated uh, in, in a patient who has uh, a COVID uh, because you'll have to weigh the benefit to the baby basically at a, since uh, the, it hasn't been shown that the steroids will worsen the uh, COVID situation per se, then I would still suggest that if you are dealing with a baby prematurely, it will be beneficial to, to give the, the dexamethasone and magnesium sulfate so that you can be able to uh, mature the lungs and also neuroprotect the baby. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think yes, uh, maybe Maureen. you take the last question. Yes, uh, there's please an do. Issue, uh, I think it has been answered, but probably specifically, uh, somebody had COVID-19, has recovered and wants to travel and requires vaccination 
for travel, how soon can they get the vaccine? Um, so it's Shalini. Um, Shalini. Um, thank you, Maureen. What we recommend is uh, 14 days from um, your COVID vaccine to other vaccines. The SAGE is continuing to update and look at um, information related to co-administration. We just have very little data um, at this time, but there are ongoing studies specifically related to flu vaccine. Over. Uh, sh okay, Shalini, that was regarding uh, other vaccine. Uh, the person had COVID, but needs to travel. So some countries are you're not allowed to travel unless you get the COVID vaccine. So how soon from the COVID infection can they get the COVID vaccine? Oh, um, pardon me. Um, so I actually answered that question. Yes. Chat, um, and essentially what we say is um, once you've um, recovered from your acute illness, you can go ahead and, and the criteria for discontinuing isolation has been met, you can go ahead and be vaccinated. Um, the optimal interval between the natural infection and vaccination is not known. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and in any I, case, uh, uh, Dr. Ali, uh, many countries are, are saying that you are either vaccinated or you have had COVID infection. So if you can prove that you have had COVID infection and you have recovered, there are some many countries that are actually uh, 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 allowing you to go in without being vaccinated. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. So I think probably we need to close. Uh, probably if there are any closing remarks from the panelists, we'll start with our first presenter, Dr. Owende. Uh, thank you, Maureen. I think this was a, a great session, um, and, uh, great presenters here. Um, looking forward to the guidelines from the Ministry of Health in regards to vaccination of pregnant and breastfeeding moms. Thank you. Mercedes, closing remarks? No, I just um, well wanted to thank you all for um, attendance and your questions. I was very pleased to to be with you, and I hope that um, WHO guidance will um, help um, Kenya to um, develop their own uh, guidelines on, on um, pregnancy and vaccination. Thank you very much, um, and Shalini. Um, thank you very much, Maureen. I just want to say thanks very much for all, that, all of the people that attended and listened. Um, similar to Mercedes, I hope that the um, WHO products can be helpful to Kenya um, as you develop your um, policy um, and implement it. Okay, I think before I hand over to our convener, Dr. Koro, uh, I'd just like to say from me what I've taken home is that we can vaccinate all pregnant and breastfeeding women. And um, there's no room, I think that really has to be reiterated for all this uh, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, iv ivermectin. And uh, so please, um, if you can, uh, for the healthcare workers who are listening, who are um, doing the vaccinations, please don't turn away vac uh, pregnant women. They are dying and the vaccine can make a difference between whether they're going to live or die. So if somebody is willing to do so, let's vaccinate as we're waiting for the guidelines to come out. I'll hand over to Dr. Okoro uh, as the convener of this particular meeting. Thank you, Maureen, as also co-moderator for this session. And we thank all the facilitators, all the participants. We had 1,020 participants selecting plus one minus two. And it has been quite awesome. I thought I was wondering whether we'll finish the two hours or we'll finish at 1120, that there will be nothing else to present. But I see we may have not even had enough time to answer, to respond to all the questions. Quite a great topic and uh, there are many concerns being raised. So of course, one of which is the guidance which will come, we hope will be developed soon regarding to support uh, the vaccination of pregnant women, or those who are intending to get pregnant, the pregnant and those who are breastfeeding. And again, also the data on, pregnant, on 
COVID in pregnancy is still missing. I think this is some of the two issues that we need to address. So without much ado, let me also take this opportunity to thank also um, the convener, Dr. Kinudia, for setting this up. We've been in discussion for this to take place. And we look forward to engaging much more and I appreciate uh, Dr. Teshome uh, from the Harare, the WHO office in Harare the, for the guidance and the local office, the Kenya country office, Dr. Chabi, Dr. Lavusa, who is not with us this, this, this morning. We look forward to form more sessions in the future and have a great day ahead. We do hope uh, uh, Mercedes and Shalini, can we be able to share these presentations with the participants? I know we have had many questions on the requests. Is it okay? Uh, yeah, happy to share. No, no problem. Okay, fine. Thank you so much. So we'll be able to share with the, with the participants. Thank you, Dr. Maureen. Thank you all. We really appreciate the support from the colleagues.